Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having Piotr here from uh, our Institute of Physics. And today, he's going to talk about objectivity of classical quantum stochastic process. Uh, Piotr, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, right. So, thanks for having me uh, uh, and allowing me to talk in this high tech environment. This is the first time for me when there is a recording at the same time when uh, I can do physical stuff as well. So, okay, anyway. All right, so, so let, let me start with, uh, okay, so this, this title right, is, a, is a mouthful. So let me start by like deciphering what's going on here because it's a bunch of keywords, everything is confusing. So as I will decipher it, uh, I will at the same time explain the motivation for the uh, for the talk, basically. Okay, so I will start from the end. Uh, so we have here a thing called quantum stochastic processes. That's not my name. I, I think it was first coined by Davis in the 50s or 60s, uh, perhaps. But what it basically means is that the quantum stochastic process is uh, basically when you are doing a sequential quantum measurement. Okay, so it's a it's tempting to a stochastic process because uh, when you do sequential measurements, you know, each measurement result is basically a, a stochastic variable, like you don't know what you get, there's some probability distribution. It is, in, it is a sequence, uh, a chronological sequence, right? So that sounds like stochastic process, but uh, mathematically speaking, it's not necessarily a stochastic process. Uh, hence, you add quantum to break it, right? So it's a special kind of uh, multivariate uh, stochastic variable that you obtain from doing a, a sequential measurement. So then the classical quantum stochastic process, well, the classical is supposed to cancel the quantum, okay? So this is what, what happens. You say that you have classical quantum stochastic process when it happens that the thing you are doing actually give a stochastic process okay sometimes it can it can happen in general it does not but when it does you just add classical to cancel quantum and you end up with stochastic process and the objectivity here is, is my addition this this is what i will try to show you that uh, you see when you are measuring things and you, and it uh, appears as a uh, trajectory of a stochastic process you can say that something that uh, is uh, subjectively perceived by the, the classical observer, right? So when you do measurements, the observable you are monitoring looks like a stochastic process. But this begs the question, can we make this picture that we are seeing as a classical observer, can we make it objective? Can we make it real somehow? So I will try to convince you that uh, yes, we can. This is a question that can be answered and the answer is quite interesting. All right, so let's start with the uh, sequential measurements or uh, the classical observer. And so uh, the setup is a standard, standard thing. So we have some uh, quantum system with uh, dynamical, some dynamical law given by a unitary evolution operator uh, generated by some Hamiltonian. We pick observable f. It has a uh, spectral decomposition. It has eigenvalues small f, and we have a projection operators p of f that project on the eigenspaces. Uh, so those eigenspaces they define the orthogonal partitioning of the Hilbert space, right? So the sum over f all the p's you get identity. They are orthogonal, so p times p delta times P because it's a projector. And uh, uh, according to the standard rules of quantum mechanics, when you have an observable, you have this partition, you, you can associate it with some measuring device. How the measuring device works, we don't talk about it. This is the primitive notion of the theory. We just uh, assume that you have a some device that does the measuring. You can read it out, and it's somehow connected with this. Uh, uh, this partition, right? So now uh, to describe uh, what what we will see when we look at the readings of the device, the Born rule. So uh, when we are when we 
do the measurement and we observe a sequence of results uh, starting from F1 and we do some Fn that were uh, read out at times consecutive times so starting from Q1 and we get Tn. The probability of getting this sequence is uh, given uh, by this formula Tn of all the arguments and it's, uh, it can be written in this form. So we have some initial states, some initial condition for our system and uh, you basically start with, which is with uh, projection operators but in uh, Heisenberg picture okay this is where the time evolution comes in and uh, on the left side you have like progressively going forward in time basically on the right side you, you're going like, backwards in time in a sense and you trace everything so I will be using this kind of formula all the time basically so let me introduce some shortcut notation okay so instead of writing this whole list of arguments I will just use the quasi vector notation and when I have a product of operators just let me write it like so with this uh, product symbol it needs to be understood as a ordered uh, product right so starting from n and we get one just like here and this one goes backwards okay so this probability distributions uh, so they describe what classical observers see when they look at this observable f okay so we could say that this is the description of the perceptions of classical observer okay and you can even say that uh, uh, any classical observer will use this kind of formula right so we can say okay so all classical observers will see the same thing when they are doing when they are looking at this observable f so you could say they so they have some subjective uh, perception of this observable but they share the same subjective perception right so it's like uh, inter subjective among classical observers this is like the te technical term for that um uh, so i want to ask because like you know in uh like in quantum mechanics, we have observables that do not commute, like position momenta. And yeah. then, uh, like, you know, classically, we, at some level of accuracy, you ascribe, uh, to, to, like, on the level of Gaskell theory, we sort of, they, jointly, uh, they are jointly measurable, but in quantum, they are not. But uh, doing measurements of two non commuting observables doesn't fit in this picture, really. Right? Well, I mean, you could. Because it's just one observable at this moment, right? That's yeah, right. I mean, you you could uh, you could add another observable, right? You would have another set of uh, uh, projection operators. You could have another device that measures this observable. Like you, you could just squeeze it in the sequence, right? If right. You, so you, you want complicate to... the game. But have different projective measurements. Yeah, you you could sure. you could do that, but uh, that like you said, that would complicate the game, but it wouldn't. Uh, give us something really interesting. So let's stick to this uh, simpler uh, case. When there's one observable f, uh, just keep keep track of f, and and we'll be fine. All right. Uh, okay. So if this was a classical physics, okay. So and we were talking about observing some physical quantity f, right? So in classical physics, this this dynamical variable would basically trace some kind of trajectory that is like on this picture right and then the measurements of this uh, observable would amount to basically uncovering the uh, already traced uh, values right so it's like the, the this proverb that when the uh, tree falls the classical tree falls it makes a sound even if there is no one to hear it right so the sound is a trajectory basically and when you are there yeah to make, uh, to make uh, along that question mm -hmm. because if you, uh, you, you, when you talk about objectivity that means uh, you are also allow observer changing the basis right like uh, spin spin g x direction and then somebody observes something spin x direction and then all observer must see actually same uh, same phenomena, uh, 
uh, even to changing the measurement of the device, uh, whatever they want. Yeah, well, I, I will, as we go along, I will be like more and more precise what I mean about, about objectivity, okay? Because what you are saying here, it, it could be some kind of objectivity. But here, let's focus on the on this one observable, okay? And uh, how it looks like to, to observers. Right now we have a classical observer. So we, how it looks like is described by this uh, born distributions that we just defined. And let's just stick to this particular setup. And so far we can only say that any classical observer will see the same thing because they will use the same set of uh, probability distributions, right? So they see the same thing. So it's intersubjective among those classical observers. If you introduce another, for example, a bunch of observers looking at the same system at the same time, for example, and each one is measuring different observables, that, that's a different uh, context, let's say. So it's a it's, it's valid setup, of course, but let's, let's stick to this one. Uh, uh, then it could be generalized, I guess. Okay, but so classical physics, what you, what you would observe is a, uh, you would imagine that there is a trajectory and you just uncover its values, right? And uh, fortunately, there is very uh, simple way to like formally, uh, uh, there's a simple formal condition when this kind of picture actually works, okay? So we have our probabilities PN. So for them to uh, describe something like this, the theory of probability tells us that those probability distributions have to be Kolmogorov consistent to give us this kind of picture. Okay. And this consistency means that you take some PN, so N measurements, you pick one of the time points, let's say I, or PI, and you sum over the results at this time point, right? So you take a, you marginalize this probability distribution. And if this, uh, marginalization gives you p n minus one when there the you know the time point that we picked is simply cancelled and it's just it's not there you say that this family of probabilities is consistent and then uh, okay of course this in general for general quantum uh, mechanical observables, this is not satisfied, okay? Just keep it in mind, it's a special case. To have this, there has to be a very special case. The, the system has, the dynamics has to be set up properly, okay? And the observable has to be picked properly and then so on and so forth. But if, if this is satisfied, then uh, this picture works. And let me like, uh, like summarize what, what, what it means, okay? With, uh, by reviewing a, a bit of a, uh, like the basics of the theory of stochastic processes. Okay, so, so when it happens that this condition satisfies for all ends, for all, all times and, uh, and so on, then uh, there is a Kolmogorov extension theorem that tells, you, tells us that this family, it defines a stochastic process, F of T, okay? And it defines it in the sense that this infinite family of uh, probability distribution it can be, uh, in a sense, combined or extended into a, a probability functional. Okay, so this is the probability distribution uh, for whole functions. Okay, for whole trajectories of the stochastic process. Right. Uh, so those trajectories are realizations of the process. Okay, so. Uh, so if this is the case, then uh, this uh, sequential measurement, you know, it's, it is this kind of uncovering of values because what you are doing is the result of I is basically a, uh, a trajectory evaluated at this point in time, okay? And the trajectory is distributed according to this uh, master distribution, okay, of, of whole trajectories. So, uh, and to like uh, basically an excuse to uh, give some 
notation and definitions. So if we have a uh, this probability distribution, we can think about expectation values, right, or stochastic averages. So we have some functional, some functional G that depends on the stochastic process F, right, and we want to calculate the average. So on the one hand, you can just, uh, of course, use this distribution and just calculate this uh, abstract uh, functional in integral with the distribution, right? Uh, but this is a probability distribution. So we have a, a law of large numbers. So equivalently, you could calculate this expectation value by doing a sample average on the infinite ensemble of uh, of measured trajectories, basically, independently measured trajectories. And uh, uh, this, this link between this master distribution and those uh, so called John distributions. GM. It's, uh, I think, the best way to illustrate it is to look at the special case of uh, expectation values to look at the moments. Okay. So you take a product of, uh, uh, of, stoch of stochastic processes, but evaluated at specific times and you average. Right. So formally, this would be given by this kind of integral. Right. But you can rewrite it. Uh, so instead of using this abstract uh, functional integration, you can write it as a, a normal integration or a sum using standard functions with some weird functionals. And those uh, those joint distributions that are our PNs that are at the moment consistent, you can think of them as a uh, yeah, the, you know just do the average of deltas, right? So we pick out the concrete values of the of the trajectory. So like th th this is so this is the, the link between uh, this master distribution and, and the joint distribution is whole family right? and, and you can this link exists only when you have this consistency okay if and only uh, and again in general for quantum measurements this doesn't work you don't have this consistency hence there is a quantum stochastic process right for, for measurements but when this works you, you can say that the classical observer sees the trajectories, so there is a tra trajectory picture, let's say, uh, which means basically all this stuff here, okay? Uh, all right, so uh, li like I said, the thing that I, I want to do is to, uh, okay, right, so we, we have a quantum stochastic process, this condition tells us when it's classical quantum stochastic process. And now let's try to talk about the, this objectivity. Okay, so to, so far we can only talk about this in the context of, of measurements, right? So we have to find a way to like take this trajectory picture and somehow export it to some different context, the context where we don't have classical observers where you don't have uh, uh, sequential measurements, it's basically something completely different and to show that the same picture applies there as well. Okay, so let's try to construct this kind of scenario. Okay, so if not classical observer, then non-classical observer. Okay, so what is non-classical observer? So basically just any other quantum system O, okay? that is brought into contact with the system S that we are measuring before. And for the system to observe the observable F, well, the interaction between them have to involve this operator F in some way, okay? So the minimal model of this kind of observing interaction is something like this, right? So you have a, a pre-evolution in O, pre-evolution in S, and the, the simplest form of coupling that involves F, so some operator G O on the side of O, and our observable F G. So this Hamiltonian generates the uh, evolution operator, which we can switch to, uh, and we will switch to uh, interaction picture. So we extract the pre evolution and we are left with V O S, which is given by this standard time order exponent. And uh, this is where the operator F ends up in, okay, it's isolated to this uh, VOS. And because it's a, uh, you know, the product of operators in O and S, it's an operator that acts on total space, okay? 
Uh, okay, so uh, when this our non classical observer interacts with, uh, with observable F, of course, there will be some changes in its dynamics, right? So, uh, like the simplest and most intuitive way to uh, quantify those changes is to look at the uh, interaction picture of the reduced state of O, okay, like standard quantity. So we take a product initial state. So this initial state of O, the initial state of S is the same as, as was before. Okay. Uh, we have our interaction picture evolution operators and we trace, trace over S only, right? And if there was no interaction or the, or the interaction was trivial, this would just, nothing would happen, right? So it just gave us row O. But there is non non trivial interaction, so there is some there will be some change, some non trivial change. Uh, okay, so this is the observer, right? So now we need some way to like, define this perception of observable f. Okay, and this is where like non trivial stuff comes in. So it turns out uh, if you know what you're doing, you can just take this formula. For the reduced uh, density matrix, and there is a way. It's a, it's a, it's not it's not an approximation. It's an, uh, just some exact transformations due to the to the formulas you get. But you can basically rewrite it in the form the parametrization that looks like some kind of average. Okay, it's not a real average. It's a quantum average or Q average, if you wish. And what it does is basically like replaces the operator f with uh, like two component quasi stochastic process okay it has two components one is f one is f bar and the uh, the averaging is done with uh, this weird uh, quasi probability distribution or q q probability distribution if you will it's not a real probability distribution because it, in general it's complex value but it's a it's a functional of two trajectories one trajectory goes uh, into the operator that goes forwards in time. One goes, the F bar goes to one that goes backwards in time. Uh, so to break it down a little, little bit more finely, so you can rewrite this general formula when the operator F hides in DOS. Okay, it hides here. So encode it in here. You can rewrite it in such a way that this observable now is represented by two components Q process. Okay, so operator is uh, mapped into a two component kind of stochastic process. Okay, and this uh, representation works in the in the following way that any operator that came from system S in the original formula, so basically F was here, is replaced by one of the trajectories of Q. Okay, so this operator here, uh, this functional. It's derived from the original DOS, but you look at the formula as it's time ordered x, but instead of operator f, like, like it was here, there is a function. Okay, it's kind of clear what's, what's going on here. Well, but like, are you doing some form of path integrals under the hood, or like, because so far those are just formal expressions? Yeah, right? they are, they are uh, formal expressions. So, so left hand side is linear in. Uh, in row O, right? So, so the like other other things would be linear. So you can, I mean, just those. Do, like, what are those? Are you gonna explain what are those trajectories? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down in a sec. Yeah. But the the, the thing, you know, it's a, we start with this thing where the f comes in as an operator, right? Yeah. And I'm telling you, okay, believe me, that you can rewrite in such a way that operators turn into functions, basically, kind of stochastic processes. But there are two of them, two components. One is F, one is F bar. And uh, so w whenever there was operator F somewhere in the formula, now it's uh, one of the components, right? But one trajectory feeds basically the evolution that goes forwards in time. The other one uh, feeds the one that goes backwards in time, okay? And, uh, uh, and the thing, the distribution, of those trajectories for, for this process, this with process, is this uh, function on Q, which is complex value. So it's not really probability distribution. So that's the structure that you get. 
just like, uh, so can I think of it like what I usually do in such situations? I uh, spectrally decompose operator F there in V, VOS up there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or in the Hamiltonian. I can I can always spectrally decompose F, something that was on the first slide. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah and then yeah. exactly in in some leftover half quantum V, yeah. what I have are the eigenvalues here that are yeah, yeah, yeah. along the V evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's it. So this is this is how on this technical is how, side how, how it is yeah, 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 it's just you know the algebra is pretty it's atrocious. I mean there are a lot of lines, yeah. a lot of Transformations, but when you know what you're looking for, it's uh, you know, it's the structure emerges. So, let me break it down a little bit more. So, again, uh, just to, to write it on one, one page. So, the, the Q average, right? So, you have some functional of those two components, right? So, it's uh, formally defined as a double integral with the distribution QF, our central object. And that because it's not a probability distribution, okay, so there is no law of large numbers. So those trajectories f, f bar, right, you, you cannot like sample them somehow and then use them to calculate the average like you, like, like you could with stochastic process, okay. So, so you don't have this uh, trajectory sample, okay, so th that's a big difference. Uh, Okay, but, but when you are doing actual practical applications, so what Yarek was alluding to basically, is uh, uh, you don't work with this kind of abstract things. You work with, uh, you want to work with normal functions basically. So whenever you have any kind of uh, functional G, you can always like expand it into series or whatever, and you are working with moments, right? So things that look like this. For Z, you can put F or F bar, okay? And those guys formally are given by this uh, integral, but in practice you can rewrite it as a normal sums, okay, with functions, with, with functions Q and F, okay. So those guys are the uh, equivalent of joint distributions, uh, and they are defined in an analogous manner as uh, joint distributions for stochastic processes, right? So just pick the values at, at specific times okay of those two trajectories and this is where uh, this is good news here because this guy can be written in like a this analytical simple formula for, for this guy and and you, you can see here a, like a, a the things that Yarek was talking about I mean the formula you have the initial state of system s and here, here you have a whole sequence of projection operators on the eigen spaces of the observable, right? Uh, and just just a reminder to Heisenberg picture of, of, of this, PF is the Heisenberg picture, right? That has spectral decomposition. So it's very similar to the form rule, right? You trace, you have a sequence of projections, you have initial state. But the, the difference is that the, the sequence that goes backwards in time, this is where F bars come in. Okay. So one trajectory is sampled here on the left side, and the other is sampled on the right side. Okay. Uh, and the interesting thing about this guy is that uh, it, it satisfies the you know, like generalized consistency. Uh, so we had the cons Kolmogorov consistency for to get a stochastic process, right? So we picked uh, some Pn and we marginalized over one of the time points, and you get Pn minus one, right? So here we have a generalization of that. Uh, so you you have your Qn, you pick one time point, but you sum over both arguments, f and f bar, right? And it's pretty easy to see the, what will happen here, right? If you sum over i, right, this is a projection, so you get identity, but you also sum over a bar, so you get, get identity on the other side as well. So you will just reproduce q and minus one. So you have this generalized consistency, which justifies why I was able to switch between this abstract form and the joint distribution form. Okay, 
Thanks. So just a question, Jotek, like in this original quant uh, sequential quantum process that you sketched in the beginning of your talk, uh, you don't have to I think, go all the way because it's in the very beginning of the talk. Yeah. Like uh, there, it was so that uh, those operators that come like that are to the left, like the arguments, they were just matching exactly the ones that are to the right. Yes. Right? Like those FIs were equal to like in your other language, like fi was equal is equal to fi bar, right? So you kind of don't see those uh, like in in your formula for like those definitions of like consistency, like uh, you like those probably that more general objects appear somehow, right? Yeah. When you so you can, can you access like okay like so is it a, just like a technical tool or, or yeah yeah I mean you know. There's always like there are a few levels down, okay, the rabbit hole. But uh, yeah, there, there are oh, some quantum measure stuff underneath. And uh, mm -hmm. but we will use this fact that this is like the, the similarity, right? That this is now what? Let me just continue. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I think this will be simpler. So the forms are this consistency, generalized consistency. And uh, uh, okay, so with this formula, you can know. Okay, so so we arrive at those few probabilities uh, as a, a way to like quantify how uh, this observable f affects the state of the observing system, right? Of the non classical observer, right? But, but wait, so this this q probabilities don't have to be like. Negative, no, because like, you just know, complex have... value in general, right? So, you, you have some general complex value, real imaginary part, non trivial in general, right? But uh, uh, so, so we, we found this guy in the example, in the context where we looked at the evolution of the non classical observer, right? And what it does is this. Uh, Distribution Q it basically like encapsulates the total totality of the influence from this observable F exerted onto non-classical observer, right? So I think it's fairly it's fair to say that it's a this is a thing that basically uh, describes how this non-classical observer sees this obser observable F, right? So this is a way to describe the perception of F for non-classical observer, right? But this formula here, it also tells us that uh, you, you can treat these guys uh, as a, like standalone objects, okay? That you, you can abstract it from this one specific context because you have a system, you have evolution operators, you have some observable, it has its spectral decomposition, you have initial condition, you can just calculate this stuff, right? And you can just generate this whole family of, of guys. And they basically describe you the maybe not the state, but kind of dynamics of this observable F, right? And then when non-classical observer comes in, it couples to F. So the way this dynamics influences O is described by this these guys, which are given totally by the system S. Okay. So this is like observer independent way to describe the dynamics of observing, okay? Because nothing here depends on the choice of observer O. I'm, I'm confused because you derived it under the assumption that there is some specific interaction, right? So even though yeah, right but... between observer and your like, so would it be yeah, yeah. What? I'm actually a bit confused because like you, you had some coupling there, like between your system and observer. Yeah. And there was something on the system side, uh, something on the observer side, this operator G0. Yeah, yeah. So so the G0, even though formally the, the, those things they don't appear in your I mean, okay, they, they do appear. So like there is some leftover of that. Yeah, so it's, it's not independent from this. Oh, it, it is, you know, because this guy here. Okay. Right, which this describes how the those trajectories F are distributed, right? Yeah. This guy is independent of choice of O in the coupling, right? The, the coupling O sits here, but if I choose something different, you know, it will change this operator V, but F's, they won't change, 
would be the same way. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I think okay that, that actually the whole package gives you the interaction of observer with your system because if you just set this coupling to be trivial, like this, this you will even though you have some formula like QF, right? Like you will not, uh, you know, like if, if you oh, don't you have uh, if you have trivial coupling like like identity. There was some function of f for example right something more complex well, what i'm you, just saying you still is that get the same for thing. the interaction for this problem both things matter like you cannot sort of just say that everything is encapsulated in yeah, QF, I mean, this function okay right because like if it was like, like uh, yeah. for example if you if you took some something some function of operator f instead of the simple form Okay, but the, the only thing that uh, matters on the side of uh, of S would be this operator F. So it's some, not the product, but some more complicated function. Well, QF, pardon, QF, it depends on row O, no? On the initial state of observer or? No, no, no. Or not? Only on of the system S. Aha, only on the system S and only on the spectral projectors of the F. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is basically... And there is operator F somewhere in your quantum formulas. This is what with an example of the reduced state. Uh, you can rewrite it in such a way that this operator disappears, and instead you get those components of this Q process, and they are distributed according to you know distribution that depends only on the properties of the system. Okay, so in this sense, it's independent of the choice of, of the observer or uh, okay, so right, so, so you can think of it as a standalone thing, a description of dynamics of observable F. Uh, I think I, I showed with the example I showed, you, you could think of it as a way to describe the perception of this observable F by non classical observers. And so, so we have this is one bit that that was, was needed because you want to like compare what classical observers saw with what non-classical observers can see. So we have now this quantity Q, which somehow like uh, gives us this uh, interface. And uh, of course, what we already discussed, this formula is very similar to the one for the probability, born, born rule probabilities, right? So in other words, you can, you can say that this perception of classical observers is a part of this Q probability, right? Because I can like decompose Q into its diagonal part, which is the same as PN, and there is a reminder, the interference there, as, as we, we came up to call it. And uh, for the functional uh, form, we can do the same kind of uh, uh, partitioning. So, this guy describes the perception of non-classical observer. This guy describes the perception of classical observer, but it is a part of this guy. So it means that now we have apples and apples, right? We can compare them, right? And, the, and like the simple, simple, the most simple conclusion we can draw out of this comparison is that, well, in general, the perception of F for non-classical observers is not the same as the perception of class of f for classical observers because they differ by this interference term which is good i mean you know classical observers are kind of special if they were not special at all that would that would seem like uh, we are doing something wrong i guess so uh, but we are we are not we are not interested in like a comparing general perceptions. We are interested in the trajectory picture, right? So now, what happens when we uh, when we are in the case when those guys are consistent, right? So the classical observer sees trajectories. What are the consequences for the perceptions of non-classical observers? All right, so. Uh, Using the fact that, uh, you know, using... uh, sorry, but can I interrupt you just a little bit? Like you had just kind of specific model of coupling of the observer and the system that you are measuring, right? Uh, 
And uh, like I, I'm just wondering to what extent what you are saying is something specific, uh, concerns like specific properties of this minimal coupling model. And to what extent this is uh, like a general feature one would get, uh, let's say, because okay, mathematically, what sort of happens is that you have those like instruments, right? Like that sort of you can view those sequences. Okay. Because basically, there is like a lot of ways just to put it yeah. in this concern. So, it's a multitude of ways in which observer can measure uh, mathematically at least conceivable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so, so, so that's the, all the state them. was the simplest, simplest case. If you, for example, if you consider some kind of correlation function. Uh, of uh, observables uh, in system O, okay. Uh, so you would you will you you could this, so we have correlation function of those uh, uh, operators that live only in O. You yeah. can show that you can also write it as a this Q average using the same distribution QF. Okay, so basically any quantity that you could imagine. Okay, for uh, for the system O that is coupled to operator F, the coupling could be made, made more complicated. Oh, oh, oh that's, that's the point, because general coupling, you can you can represent as a sum of such uh, simple terms. Okay, it's a simple factor. Yeah, yeah but be, be, I mean, be any finite dimensional coupling, I can always break it into those yes, terms, yes, which yes, necessarily, yes, yes, not yes. necessarily commute. So I understand you can also treat it I mean, if, 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 you, if you took, okay, if there were more operators on the side of S, yes, okay, okay. that that would, more, that would more non-commuting S. Okay, that would complicate the notation basically. But you could still do it. Yeah? Yes, yes. And even if you took some different form of the coupling, but it just but in such a way that it uses operator F still, I don't know, F square it would be or something. I don't know, some 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 complication. It, you could still write it in the same way. No, no, this is this is not a complication. The, 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 the real that you are taking functions of G0 or F, this is not a complication. But what the real complication is, is that when you have more terms like that and non yeah. So, yeah. so if there are the most general so If there are more observables, F1, F2, F3, exactly. non right? you, you could still write it in this kind of fashion. It would just get more and more complicated. You would get like uh, distributions for more components, basically. The okay. Q, Q distributions. So there would be like uh, the picture would more be... pairs of vectors. There would be F, yeah, F bar, some G, G bar, I mean, and so on. You, you would do projection, yeah, you would projections indexed by the number F1, F2, F3, and so okay. on. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you know that the formulas will get more complicated, but no, nothing like uh, fundamentally interesting would happen from this kind of complication. This simple and sleek example with one F is uh, it's like it, it, it has all the interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. So the perceptions are different. Okay, that's good. But projective picture okay so so for the classical observer to see trajectories right we said that pns have to be Kolmogorov consistent right so using the fact that pns are here and the q's are consistent i can like combine those two things to basically calculate what is the rebinder okay so if this is zero then i have Kolmogorov consistency Okay, but in general, you have a reminder that's given by uh, this uh, interference term, by the quantum part of the Q probabilities. Okay, so we want to so we want to have a case when there is a uh, there is consistency, there is trajectory picture in measurements. So the simplest reading would be okay. So this has to be zero. Okay, then we have a Kolmogorov of consistency by virtue of you know right hand side is zero. Uh, but the problem with this formula is it, it, it's uh, it's not very transparent. Okay, it's difficult to like deduce what what are the consequences of this for non-classical observer. So to kind of remedy this problem, I propose to look at the uh, stronger but simpler condition 
And instead of this monstrosity, I just say, okay, let's consider a case when all the interference terms are just zero, okay, individually. And of course, this guy is stronger in the sense that it implies this weaker condition. So if all interference terms are zero, this is zero, and you have Kolmogorov consistency, so trajectories for classical observers. Uh, and it's highly probable that it also uh, goes other way around. Okay, it's not it's not the, math, the, the mathematical proof of this is uh, I don't think it can be obtained easily. But if you don't have a way to uh, you know to give a strict mathematical proof, you can like look at uh, uh, some some examples. Okay, so we we investigated a bunch of uh, interesting physical models and models of physical systems, right? And we identified a bunch of them, a cool models, really cool, that give you this. Okay, the pseudo density condition is satisfied. But I'm not aware of even one example of a physical system that would give you this, but not this. Okay, so the it seems it seems that uh, there is there is a probability or even high probability that this condition is spurious. Okay, that. To satisfy it, you, you actually have to also satisfy. It. So let's let's say that uh, yeah, let's say they are equivalent. Okay, for now, if someone finds a counterexample, that would be very very interesting. But uh, I haven't seen one yet, and it's very difficult to imagine how you could combine such such thing. Uh, okay, so to get uh, in other words, to get a trajectory picture for classical observer, the interference term has to disappear. Okay, this is what this is what what we are getting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm almost done. So. Uh, um, okay. So, what are the consequences of this guy for the non-classical observer? Okay, and, and this is easy to analyze, fortunately. Uh, okay. So, the consequences. Aside the Kolmogorov consistency. So, one thing is that, well, if you eliminate uh, interference, then, well, the Q probabilities are basically the PNs, right? Okay, so the Q probability turns into a proper probability. Uh, so, any Q average, so we, when you have a, uh, some functional that depends on both components of Q process, if this disappears, then it reduces, you know, the, those two components basically collapse into one component. But also, since this implies consistency, right? So this component that remains is just proper stochastic process. Okay. So when you have this, an EQ average reduces to normal stochastic average. Okay. So that's that's one. So. In the case of the uh, uh, non-classical observer, this means that the, uh, the reduced state is reduced to uh, like stochastic evolution. Okay, two components collapse into one, and the uh, quasi-average quantum average reduces to normal stochastic average. So it basically means that uh, our initial Hamiltonian, when there was coupled to real system S, you can effectively replace it with a uh, like stochastic Hamiltonian, when instead of system S, you just plop in the external field, a surrogate field, if you wish, because it's a, a surrogate for the operator F. Okay. Uh, so it means that you can simulate the evolution of the operator of, of system O with a stochastic model, basically. Okay. And we are almost there uh, because this stochastic process here is the same process that we are measuring when we are doing a when we have a Kolmogorov consistency, right? As we said, trajectory picture means that when you are doing the measurement, you're basically sampling a trajectory, right? Those trajectories are really the same trajectories that are involved into this kind of average for non-classical observer. And to, to show it, you, you can basically, I mean, the, 
you know, using the law of lot numbers, the stochastic average can be approximated by a sample average over some ensemble, sufficiently large ensemble. So the problem is where to get the samples for your ensemble. Where, well, since the probability distributions that govern this stochastic average here are the same probability distributions as those, those governing the measurement results, right? So the trajectories you can use use here are the same trajectories you are measuring. So you measure the F, you store the results in, on your hard disk, uh, and then you can use it as a um, as a way to calculate sample average for your some system you are coupling to your observable F. Okay, so basically the trajectories that I measured in, uh, by the classical observer are interchangeable with uh, trajectories that are needed by the are seen by the non-classical observer. So to, to summarize this, uh, um, to summarize this, so so we had a um, the perceptions of F for classical observer were described by form distributions PN, right? So it was the how how F looks like for classical observers was intersubjective among all the classical observers because they all use the same PNs to describe what they see. On the other hand, we had the uh, the perceptions of F for non-classical observers described by key probabilities. So they were also intersubjective for uh, non-classical observers, but there was no intersubjectivity between classical and non-classical guys. But now I'm saying that if this condition is satisfied, then this intersubjectivity is extended to, uh, you know, to, to, to encompass both classes or both categories of observers. Okay. So you, you could stay at this and saying that, okay, so it's uh, the trajectory picture is it's getting more intersubjective, but since there are those two classes, you know, classical and non-classical observers are categorically different, we would, we would expect that you know it's not just quantitative uh, you know extension of intersubjectivity, would like something more. So we, typically this is a sufficient condition to basically upgrade intersubjectivity to objectivity. Okay, hence the title objectivity of classical quantum stochastic process, right? So when sequential measurements are transmuted into sampling of trajectories, so when quantum process changes into classical quantum process, it means that interference terms has to disappear, which means that the same trajectories are visible for us when we are doing measurement as for any quantum system coupled it is observable and uh, yeah that's basically it uh, where is the end button uh, X, S. oh this is what i wanted to say but i get some extra slides if someone was interested in examples for example for example of uh, the surrogate uh, systems and uh, yeah so that's it basically Oh, I will have a question, but I think we can thank the speaker first. Okay, that is exactly what I was about to ask. Do you have an example? Oh, yes. Do I have an example? I have a, but it's a, it's a big example. There, there, there are, there are... Do you have a simple example with a uh, few Yeah, okay. okay. Let's go through. Let, 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 let me go like this. There are, there are a couple of classes of types of systems that would give you a phi disappears. The simplest thing you can do, and I think it's the only that it's like strictly exact, is when the operator f, when you have f of the system when the commute. Okay. This is a tri trivial example. Nothing changes. Then this uh, surrogate field, this stochastic process you get as a result is basically a, a you know a static stochastic variable. So this one, this is the most trivial. And this is the most boring. And you know, okay, the other examples, 
one, which is very cool, is uh, uh, if you are really aware of this uh, Feynman argument uh, that uh, the, the, the why uh, uh, least action principle works in classical physics, right? So it's like, so there is a path integral, Feynman path integral parametrization of the uh, of the quantum mechanics, where you express everything as a, as a path integrals. Okay, let me that. So Feynman tells you that if you consider this kind of propagator, okay, a propagator like this, Feynman tells us, okay, you can write it as a, uh, as a path integral where you have action by by each bar uh, or trajectories. A path that uh, end in those points. So uh, x at e u x f. Okay. And the Feynman says, okay, when this action is big, we have a massive system, for example, big in comparison to h bar. Okay, there is some, let's say, uh, you know, this phase factor starts to rotate very fast. You have some stationary phase effects and stuff like that. And uh, basically, so the large action leads to kind of description when there is only one path uh, selected due to interference effects. And this path is a thing that uh, the stationary point of the action, so a path that minimizes the action, hence the uh, principle of, uh, of least action. Okay. And so now when you consider system for which you can apply this approximation to large, large action, you can show, provided the initial state is not a Schrodinger scat state, so it's like uh, uh, the initial state, it has to be, uh, the diagonal, diagonal initial state, so no Schrodinger cuts, then you can show that the interference can be disappeared. So, so the, the thing that you would think, you know, the system that goes to the limit of the classical limit, for it, you actually the, the interference can be disappear. The other, uh, the other class of systems is something that uh, others have found is uh, for chaotic systems, the interference times also disappears. And the last class is something I have uh, slides on, but it's big and complicated. But the setup is uh, if you imagine that your system S can be divided into two, two pieces, A and B, and they interact with each other, but the observable lives only in, in A. Okay, so it's like your system is actually open to some environment. And when this environment is, uh, you know, the, the correlation uh, time is short enough and other bone mark of uh, basic uh, arguments, you can show that uh, a properly chosen interaction uh, can lead to, uh, can, can eliminate the interference there. This is how you get, for example, a telegraph noise. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess that all of the classes, so, and you can mix and match. You can have open large system, or open chaotic system, large chaotic system. There are like this, 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 uh, this guy. You know, this is, you cannot do much with this guy. It's quite, it's quite boring. Um, so, sorry, okay. I have a, I have a question. So, uh, if you say that this uh, interference term disappears, apart from the trivial case. Uh, it does not disappear strictly, I suppose. It's yeah. just it's just getting very small, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, do you have some laws of uh, how it diminishes? Does it die out exponentially, or Gaussian, or well, or there is no law? I mean, do you only know that uh, it, it depends on the on the particular system. For example, here in this large action, oh, it's like. Uh, you have to you have to investigate uh, how the you know Feynman argument works. So it's like uh, 
saddle point methods and uh, you probably could quantify it in some way but like to have a one universal way how the interference terms disappear for any model that's probably out of reach because you know the, the diversity of approximations you can use and that are accepted by this kind of parametrization and lead you to this kind of uh, classical limits you know it's it's diversity is very large so, so so each case you probably would have to investigate uh, practically how do you how do you check for uh, for those interference uh, yeah. terms dying out this is an excellent question for which i don't really have a very robust answer but, so we could just go then, case by case uh, but there, there, there are like i was thinking about some kind of uh, like method to verify uh, if this interference term disappears and one thing that, uh, that I was thinking about but I, I haven't finished it yet or like didn't develop it much is that uh, you know the linear response theory so you, you 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 so basically you pick your observable you couple it to some kind of external weak external field you do the uh, perturbation and then you measure this uh, observable how it's changed due to this perturbation and the, in the lowest order, uh, lowest order uh, approximation, you get so-called Kubo formula. The susceptibility appears there, so it's like a uh, linear response, basically. And you can show that linear response depends on the interference term. So, so this uh, fluctuation, dissipation, Kubo type relations—they depend on. Yeah, I mean, the, this is this is the quantity I'm talking about. The thing on the fluctuation the dissipation side is the dissipation the, is, is the thing i'm talking about. this is the thing that appears when you're doing a linear response so this is like a standard experimental technique you know you're doing linear response and you're probing your system so when you see a linear response it means that the interference terms cannot be zero so if you see this kind of back action because you are perturbing f and you are looking at f if it can be perturbed like that. Uh, you are sure that there is there is non-zero interference there, so the surrogate field doesn't work there. But you know, to if if it disappears, I mean, if you don't see the response, well, it's it's not that easy to say that it immediately means that uh, all interference terms are zero and stuff like that. So th th there are some ways, I guess, but I I haven't come up with like a very good answer to this. So, uh, approximately disappearing five. Uh, can I just comment on the last point that you made because it's very interesting. Uh, so there is this uh, notion in foundations of quantum mechanics uh, uh, called uh, contextuality. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, okay, like actually it comes in different flavors. You have yeah, different yeah. names, as there are different camps and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, there is yeah. one by uh, Robert Speckens, uh, okay, mm, it's one of the formulations. So basically, uh, the, the, the aim of that field is to sort of figure out what classes of quantum processes, uh, like experiments can be described using uh, quasi, using uh, quasi probability distributions that are, that don't have negativity, so comp uh, complex values to them. Okay, so like you are sort of exploring whether you can like uh, describe your experiment as yours, like as here, for example, in kind a of classical way. And then in that context, uh, uh, sort of a person I know, like could sort of investigated exactly what uh, from the linear response uh, theory can you get like a weakness of non class uh, non classicality uh, in that sense, mm -hmm. and I I guess it would imply. Uh, it's likely that it might imply your notion of non-classicality. So I, yeah, I show yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, it's, okay. Uh, it, it sounds quite relevant mm -hmm. because like yeah, he was I also think... talking about uh, like capacity, not cap capacities. Like forgot the word. Like I mean, in a response period. Yes. Yeah, so so th there's like oh, there's so many connections that I'm discovering right now because because uh, we we were. You know this whole parametrization of Q probabilities it came up for us when we are looking at the, uh, we're trying to explain how is it possible that somehow 
sometimes it holds. And for quantum in classical physics, that's like, oh, that's trivial, right? External fields, it's like very trivial kind of approximation. The theory works well with this kind of things. But in quantum mechanics, this seems, seems like a very alien kind of structure. And how it how is it possible that you can get such a thing? So when we're toying with that, we came up with this kind of parameterization. This surrogate field is basically the answer. Okay, so uh, uh, so we were looking at it from this this point of view primarily. Okay, so it's like oh, it behaves like an ex external field, and those Q probabilities were the things that you know, the the like the, the master object to describe all this stuff. But then I discovered that there is a whole like whole field of some kind of weird foundational physics uh, people uh, who, who talk about consistent histories so it's like reinterpretation of quantum mechanics that supposedly doesn't use uh, measurement and classical observers and they are like uh, and they are using the quantity they call it the coherence functional that it's the same as q probability basically but instead of like finding it in in the wild, let's say, like like I showed you in some, for example, the density matrix, they like postulate it and they check some conditions which are the same as surrogate field condition I showed you, and they then say, oh, the histories are consistent and blah 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 blah, and then I discovered that there is a whole mathematical field of quantum measures. It's like generalization of measure theory, but for quantum mechanics. And this is also connected to the same kind of formulas. And it's like, oh, it's a whole rabbit hole. So I, I'm not really surprised that someone was looking at something and there was a connection, for example, through uh, uh, in a response and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's, the rabbit hole is deep, I think. OK, do we have more questions? No, I think we can end. Let's thank the speaker again.